2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we not, may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we all must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. When uh, our body has its last heartbeat and our brain waves are turning in to, to stop and turn to nothing, life doesn't end for us. That's not the end. It's actually the, the beginning for us in many ways. And there's a lot of books on the, on the shelf that have stories of people who have gone to heaven or at least claim to. And I just want to say one thing about that. None of them match. They don't match. Now, that doesn't mean that they're false. It doesn't mean that the people who wrote them are, are liars. But I think it does mean that that's not where our hope should be. That's not where our faith needs to be for our eternal life. We need to have our hope in God and in His Word and what He has said to us there. And we can still read these, these stories and experiences. And they can be maybe a supplement to what we read in Scripture, but we always have to come back to what Scripture says as the basis for everything that we believe about heaven, about eternal life, and what that is. So today I'm going to kind of give a kind of a survey or an overview of what the Bible says about what we would call the intermediate state, what, what happens to us after, after we die. So human beings are of two parts, body and soul. We have a material part of us that is our body. We can touch it and feel it. But there's a soul too. And uh, this is just maybe one way to think about it in that picture there. That there's, a, a, there's an immaterial part of us that once the body dies, this immaterial part of us is, is released and it goes into heaven to be with Christ. Now there's some people out there who say that there's three parts of, of us and that'd be body, soul, and spirit. But if you read the Bible... Soul and spirit are sometimes used interchangeably. And most of the time when it's talking about a human person, it speaks of it as a material part of us and an immaterial part. So for example, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Or if Christ is in you, although your body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Uh, though I'm with you, or absent with you in body, yet I'm with you in spirit. So there's, there's an immaterial part of us and a material part of us. And the material part of us is going to perish, but that immaterial part is going to continue on. And that, that is our, our self. That's who we are. When the body dies, the soul goes to be with Christ in heaven. Or at least for those who believe, that is where it goes. In Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, it says, The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. So at the very beginning, God made Adam from the dust of the ground. 
and he breathed life into it. Or in Hebrew, breathe and breath is also the same word for spirit. So God made Adam to be a material being, something that you can touch and see. And then he put an immaterial part in this being too. So we have body and soul and as the dust returns to the earth, as the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, stories and, and legends and accounts that, that when, you, when you die, you maybe see a light or that you go through a tunnel or that you hover over your body or something like that. We don't know exactly what happens and how, what that's going to be like. We do know that we are going to continue on and that our soul is going to go to be with Christ. So we don't know, the Bible doesn't say if there's a tunnel or if there's a light. And maybe, maybe when, when each of us does die someday, maybe, maybe we'll experience that moment a little bit differently. I, I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say on that. What we do know, though, is that our soul or spirit will go to be with Christ. So when people say deceased loved ones are in a better place, they are correct. To be with Christ is far better than it is to be here. I like how Philippians 1 puts it. I think that I have that on the screen here. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So to be with Christ in heaven is far better than where it is here and how it is here. So when, when you're mourning the loss of a loved one and you say they're in a better place, that is perfectly accurate to say. And Paul says it himself right there. It's far better. Although when when it's said that a deceased loved one is now an angel in heaven, that's not correct. Jesus once said that we would be like the angels in heaven, but it, he never says that we would become angels in heaven. Our souls in heaven, they remain human. We don't turn into angels. That movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where, where Clarence is a, a former human being and he's now an angel, that's, that's not biblical. It's a, it's a nice movie, it's a nice story, but that's not good angelology, so to speak. We will be the same person when we are up there. Revelation 6 verse 10, it talks about, this is an interesting verse, it talks about martyrs under the throne in heaven, people who had been killed because of Christ. And it says there's lots of terrible things going on on earth. And it says they called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? How long? So that, that verse is an interesting one. Apparently, we are going to remember our earthly lives. We're going to have some memory of that. These martyrs remembered what happened to them. Now, if you even just look at your own life, if you, if you take away the bad experiences that you've had, you wouldn't be the person that you are today. Sometimes we learn the most by the, the things that, the mistakes that we make. And sometimes God shapes us the most by the, the bad experiences that we have. If you took those bad experiences away, we wouldn't be the same person when Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't forget who he was. In fact, he still had nail marks in his hands. He still had a, a side that was pierced that Thomas could touch. And so we're not going to forget who we were or what has happened to us. We're going to remember, we're going to still be the same person. We're going to have these memories. It says our deeds will follow us. In verse 10, in our passage today, even it says, For we must all appear 
before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So we're going to remember what we've done. And the things that maybe we've forgotten, we're probably going to be reminded of it. There's, it's, there's a saying I've heard once where it says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. I think that's very accurate biblically. Our deeds are going to follow us. And so there's lots of call in the Bible to do good deeds, to show love, to be like Christ. And there's a reason for that because our deeds are going to follow us. So it's not like we can just be saved and, oh, all right, we can just sit back and relax until, until we go to heaven. No, our, we have deeds to do. Not the least of which there's good work to be done and lots of people need Christ's love in our lives. But our deeds are going to follow us too. In Revelation 14, verse 13, I think I have that up there, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. So, when it says in the Bible to store up treasure in heaven, there are things that we do here and now that we can take with us later. We're not going to be able to take any of our possessions or our money or any other material goods that we have. That we can't take with us. But there are some things that we will be able to take with us. The, the good deeds that we do, the love of Christ that we show, the faith that we have now, that we can take with us. So build up that treasure in heaven because that will last forever. And it's a good thing that our sins will be erased. There's a verse in Job that says, For then you would number my steps, you would not keep watch over my sin. So life is not something to throw away. It's not something to just sit through. So don't be anxious. This life is not a waste of time. Our choices do matter still. And there's some evidence in Scripture to suggest that the souls in heaven can actually see events on earth. There's some evidence for that. There's the one verse that we just read about the martyrs in heaven. How long, Lord, until until you avenge our deaths and bring justice? There's a couple more, too. John 8, 56, Jesus is talking to the Jewish leaders. And he says to them, Your father Abraham rejoiced, that he would see my day, he saw it and was glad. So it's almost as if Abraham, when he went to heaven after he died, he got to see God's promises unfolding in history. So that when God said, look at the sky, see how many stars you have, so shall your offspring be. I think, that, I think that it's probably reasonable to think that Abraham saw how God made nations out of him and how from his line came Jesus Christ who saved the world. And now each one of us, even though we're Gentiles, we are Abraham's children now. If you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to that promise. And there's another one too. In Luke 9, 30 and 31, it talks about the transfiguration of Jesus. It says it this way, And behold, two men were talking with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So suddenly, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus and are suddenly talking about, to Jesus about what is going to happen to him. Probably is his crucifixion and resurrection. So it's almost as if they, they knew what was going on up until that point, And they were talking with him about it. So 
So we'll be out of the game, but still on the bench, so to speak. We'll still get to see what's going on, probably. There is that verse also in Hebrews 12, verse 1, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now maybe, maybe that just refers to how they are witnessing to us from the past, but maybe it's also that they are witnessing us from heaven too. So, if you can see everything that's going on on earth, or many things, or at least the big things that are going on on the earth, won't that be hard or depressing or unpleasant? And I think that we can confidently answer that as no. It is not going to be that. I think that we'll be able to see what happens next. We'll be able to see how God's plan unfolds. Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and he was glad. Abraham got to see God's plan unfold. And he was delighted. I think we'll be able to see the events of the world a lot differently than we do now. If you have the perspective from heaven, I think that what goes on on the earth looks a lot different. We'll see the world under God's control. Those martyrs in heaven asked God, how much longer until you bring justice? So right now, we have to take it on faith sometimes when the world is in upheaval and there's all kinds of chaos and terrible things happening. We have to take it on faith that God is in control. But up there, I don't think we'll have to take that on faith anymore. We'll get to see God's hand in all things. We'll see events as God's plan unfolding. We'll get to see what God is doing. We'll get to see His promises being fulfilled continually and on an ongoing basis. We'll get to see what that's like, just like Abraham did with how God's promises unfolded to him. And we'll get to ask questions about what's going on too. We'll get to ask, ask Him directly. So, what's going on here? You know, how much longer, Lord? And as Hebrews 12 might suggest, we'll get to cheer on everybody else. So just like we're sitting on the bench, we'll get to cheer on our remaining brothers and sisters. And yeah, we'll be on the bench, but, but we all enjoy going to games. People pack those stadiums so they can watch people play. And I think that when we are in heaven... We will want to be filling the stands of heaven, so to speak, to watch what is going on, how God's plan is unfolding. And we'll have the benefit of knowing that the good guys win, or the good God wins, at least. I'm going to read verse 8 one more time here. It says, Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. It will be more amazing than anything on earth. When we, when we die and we are with Christ, it's going to be more amazing than anything we've ever experienced on earth. It doesn't matter how great your life is how awesome you've had it here, how rich you are, how successful, how many pleasures and delights you've had here. Even if you had them all, it's not going to compare to what it's going to be like in the presence of Christ. Where you can see Him face to face and lock eyes with the One who saved you. Nothing's going to compare to that. Jesus on the cross said to that one, one thief, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you are going to be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow. Not someday. Not 
after you've gone through purgatory and worked off the rest of your sins because obviously you're on a cross and you've done a lot of bad things in your life, so you've got a lot of things to work off. So eventually you'll be with me in paradise. No, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Or again, Philippians 1.23, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. It's far better. It's not even close. Not even close. We will be with Christ in His heavenly glory. In His heavenly glory. We don't have an understanding of what that means or what that looks like. We only know this earth. And compared to heavenly glory, this earth is pretty pathetic. We're going to see Christ in His heavenly glory. So, like when I read Revelation and it talks about that throne room in heaven and how there's these creatures, you know, they're, they're kind of creepy looking because they have these eyes all over the place. But that, that means that they're all seeing. That means that they're very powerful creatures and day and night they just circle that throne and just say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're so full of marvel and wonder and delight that this is all that they do day and night. Be with, being with Christ in heavenly glory, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fill our our needs and our desires, it's going to meet the needs of our soul in ways that this world never could. I don't know how else to describe it. How about this? Revelation 7, 15 through 17. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. We're going to be near him. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Imagine having all of the sadness and all of the hurt and all the pain, all the trouble that you've experienced in this life wiped away like you would wipe a tear from your face. My imagination is not big enough to put myself there. But that's what it says. That's what we have to look forward to. But I do want to put one however out there. As wonderful as it is, heaven is still a waiting room. It's not going to be our final destination. There's still going to be one more step to completion. So in the beginning, God formed Adam from dust and breathed life into it. And he said it was good. Adam as body and soul was a good thing. So we were made, we were designed, we were created to be body and soul together. Not soul separated from body separate. We were designed to be material beings with immaterial souls together. So in verse 3, it talks about putting on putting it on that we may not be found naked. So being a soul without a body is not our final state. It's going to be a little awkward to be just a soul without a body. There's going to be something more that even people in heaven are waiting for. We're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. We will still long for the new heaven and earth when Christ returns. So even the people in heaven, as wonderful as it is there, far better than here, they are still waiting for Christ to return and to restore all things. 
because when Christ returns, all the souls in heaven are going to be reunited with their bodies on earth. And all of those graves are going to be empty. We're going to walk out of all of our graves just like Christ walked out of His. 1 Thessalonians 4 For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep. So when He comes back, He's going to bring with Him everybody who's up there. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So when that day comes, everything is going to be completed. Look at the screen here with me, and let's answer this together. How does the resurrection of the body comfort you? Not only my soul will be taken immediately after this life to Christ its head, but even my very flesh, raised by the power of Christ, will be reunited with my soul and made like Christ's glorious body. That's what we have to look forward to. We are not going to be disembodied souls sitting on clouds playing harps forever in heaven. Our God made this material world and He called it good. And He's going to fix it. And just as Jesus formed a material body, in doing so, In all holiness, he affirmed the goodness of our bodies, and he is going to raise those bodies. Jesus didn't die for us to be disembodied souls. He died so that even our bodies would be raised, just like his was. But a bottom line here is that our death is not the end. Usually, it's very easy, rather, to think of our life As in, okay, I'm going to live for this many years and then it's going to be done. Usually when we make plans, that's kind of how we think. But whether we are believers or not, whether we are Christians or atheists, no matter who we are or what we think is going to happen after we die, death is not the end. It's not like you can just pick your religion and decide what kind of afterlife you want to have and then that's what you will have. No. When all of us die, we are going to appear before Christ. You've heard it it was said that to uh, live each day as if it would be your last. How about this? Live each day knowing you'll live forever. Don't live each day as if it's going to be your last. Live each day knowing that you're going to live forever. And there are some things that you're going to be able to take with you into that forever, and there's some things that you're not going to be able to take with you. But you're going to be with the Lord forever. And you have the Lord in your heart now if you are a believer. But you are going to be face to face with the Lord forever. What do you want to take with you? We are not going to a grave, we are going to our Savior. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 says, Eternity has been placed in us. So, verse 9, as it says there, Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. So whether we're here or up there, our goal is the same. Our goal is to please God both now and in eternity. Let's not store up treasures on earth. Let's store up treasures in heaven, the kind that we will take with us. Because death is not the end. We're going to be with Christ forever. And let's bow our heads and let's talk to our Lord. Lord our God, we 
We look forward to that day when we will be with you forever. Lord, whether that day is sooner or rather whether it's later, Lord, we know that it's coming. So Lord, in the meantime, put it, make it our aim, the aim of our hearts to, to please you, to serve you, and to know you now even, so that, Lord, we can take that into eternity, and Lord, we can look you in the eye, and we can hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so, Lord, help us to long for that day and to live each day with eternity in our hearts. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.